After Diamond v. Deere come the cases from the Federal Circuit in 1994 of N. Ray and N. Ray Lowry. N. Ray Allopat has to do with claims that were drawn to so-called a rasterizer, which is used in a digital oscilloscope for to smooth waveform data prior to displaying the waveform on the oscilloscope screen. The invention lies in the general architecture and operation of the rasterizer to substantially eliminate the appearance of discontinuities in the waveform by changing the intensity of each pixel depending on the pixel's proximity to a waveform vector. The question was whether such a process was patentable subject matter under the U.S. Patent Law. The Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit stated that just because the claims cover a programmed general purpose computer does not make them non-statutory. Instead, a programmed general purpose computer becomes a new machine once a computer program is loaded into memory and is therefore eligible for patent protection. That same year, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit decided the case in Ray Lowry, which addressed the patentability of a memory containing a data structure. In reversing the decision of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the Federal Circuit held that the printed matter exception applies only to printed lines of characters useful and intelligible only to the human mind. Since data structures and computer software are not processed by the mind but by a machine, the exception does not apply. Consequently, a memory containing a data structure should be considered patentable subject matter and the particular data structure claimed should be considered in determining whether the invention is new and obvious. Following the 1994 decisions of Allopat and Lowry, the State Street Bank and Trust Company versus Signature Financial Group case also of the Federal Circuit held in 1998 that software programs that transform data or patentable subject matter under Section 1 of the Patent Act, even when there is no physical transformation of an article. The court emphasized that software or other processes that yield a useful, concrete, and tangible result should be considered patentable and laid to rest the business method exception of unpatentability. This meant that while prior courts considered business methods inventions to be unpatentable, the State Street Court found that these inventions are as patentable as any other inventions. In the following year, 1999, in the AT&T Corporations versus XL Communications case, the Federal Circuit reaffirmed its message to the patent bar and district courts. In the AT&T case, AT&T owned a patent to provide message records for long-distance phone calls, which were enhanced by adding a primary inter-exchange carrier indicator. Such an indicator aided long-distance carriers in providing differential billing treatment for its subscribers depending on whether a subscriber called someone with the same or different long-distance carrier. In reversing the district court's determination that the AT&T patent was invalid as not being patentable subject matter, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit held that the process was in indeed the requisite subject matter under the Patent Act and further stated that any step-by-step -step process, be it electronic, chemical, mechanical, that involves an algorithm in the broad sense of the term is a statutory process under the Patent Act. In this case, the court reaffirmed the State Street decision, finding that the business method exception and the mathematical algorithm exception were severely limited or, in fact, eliminated. With this background, we come to the Bilski v. Capos decision. Mind you, this is the first line of decision as to patentable subject matter that occurs between the broad scope of legal rights in the Wright Height versus Kelly decision and the line of cases where legal scope of rights, the rights of the infringed patentee, have been severely reduced. Since 1999, 2010, over 20 years have ensued. Having provided sufficient background for the constellation of cases that form the predicate for the Bilski v. Kappas decision, what follows is a discussion of the particular facts relating to the Bilski v. Kappas case from the initial filing of the United States patent application through the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit decision confirming the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's rejection of the Bilski patent application. 
With this background, let us review the parties involved. Plaintiffs Rand Warsaw and his then business partner Bernard Bilski devised a plan, they called it Guaranteed Bill, which they sought to patent of using fixed price contract as a way to mitigate the risk that bad weather can pose to prices and the energy and the demand for energy. They established contracts that serve to balance the risk to suppliers and consumers of energy. Let's listen to the description by Mr. Bilski as they had their day in court in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Supreme Court. The, the invention is a guaranteed energy bill, which is like a budget bill without a true-up. And it's a method of hedging both sides in the transaction. So behind giving consumers, energy consumers, a guaranteed energy bill, there's a lot of mechanics. And the mechanics involve financial transactions between energy consumption or any energy consumers and the energy providers. And that's what the invention is in a nutshell. It's a method of generating uh, guaranteed bills for consumers and also protecting energy company earnings. The named defendant, Dave Kapos, was named as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the United States Patent Office. In his capacity as Director of the USPTO, he was properly named by defendants Bilski and Warsaw, who sought to overturn the USPTO's decision. Mr. Kapos just recently became the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I think it's insightful to understand his points of view with regard to innovation and his role in making sure that innovations in technology lead us in the right direction. Consider these words from U.S. Patent and Trademark Office Director David Kapos. As we move into the second decade of the 21st century, all of us recognize that innovation is the only sustainable source of economic growth. It's also abundantly clear that intellectual property is central to innovation. Therefore, intellectual property will take on a critical role, I would assert the critical role, in this decade and beyond. To put the point another way, many factors will need to come together for the world's economy to pull itself out of recession, but all scenarios for recovery are driven by innovation. All scenarios are driven by innovation. That makes intellectual property key to economic recovery and job creation. Let's go a little deeper in understanding what the property right is that Bilski and Warsaw saw in their pending patent application. This can be seen by review of the independent claim at issue in this case. For the sake of clarity and simplicity, I will use, as I explain the scope of this claim, I will use the word the instead of set. Claim 1 then calls for a method for managing the consumption risk cost of a commodity sold by a commodity provider, such as an energy company, at a fixed price, wherein the method includes the steps or comprises the steps of initiating a series of transactions between the commodity provider, the energy company, for example, and consumers of the commodity, i.e. energy, wherein the consumers purchase the commodity at a fixed rate based upon historical average. The fixed rate for the energy purchases corresponding to a risk position of the consumer. So given a particular risk position of the consumer, these prices are determined. The next step is identifying market participants for the commodity having a counter risk position to the consumers. That is, identifying market participants for the commodity. Uh, who are the, who's in the market? How do we identify those? This is what the step calls for. Then the last step in the method is to initiate a series of transactions between the commodity provider, the energy company, and the market participants, those in the energy consumption industry. At a second fixed rate such that the series of market participant transactions balances the risk position of the series of consumer transactions. In this energy market, this method is about balancing risk and reducing costs associated with that balancing. Warsaw and Bilski saw in their claim to keep others from practicing these steps. So on April 10, 1997, this patent application was submitted to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. After processing or during processing, the United States Patent and Trademark Office routes this patent application to 
a United States patent examiner, which is the normal course of business, who examines the application. Oftentimes, more often than not, the patent examiner rejects the claims of a patent application. This cute cartoon essentially says what the examiner's job is. Why did you become a patent examiner? Because I love telling people, no, that's exactly what happened in the Bilski case.